please help me in welcoming Jeff today. <laughs> so you know, as an author, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out the perfect word to use. And so I was, I've been thinking about today and taking notes furiously throughout the day. And the only word I can come up with is, today was awesome. Oh my gosh, what a great group of speakers. What a great IT department you guys have. You know, it started out with, with uh, uh, President Danko, and I love what he said was selectively forget the past, manage the present, and create the future. He stole my theme for my whole presentation. That's, that sums it up. Uh, and then the other thing that really jumped out for me was the, the, the history study. Uh, of course, it was because Jeff's my nephew. Right? <laughs> and I give him credit. But I love history because it is um, important to understand our history, to know where we're going when we try to create the future. And the other one that really stuck out for me, and you'll, you'll hear this in the story that I tell later, was the, uh, uh, what was it, high anxiety with low risk? so that you're ready for high anxiety with high risk. What a great way to prepare. So hopefully you guys grabbed some of these themes out of today because we're at this very interesting place. The decade of the teens just ended. And we have the opportunity to look ahead at the next decade or the next 20 years. Or sorry, until 2030, the next 10 years, I can't count. And, you know, this doesn't happen very often, only about every 10 years or so. But we should take the opportunity to use this time to think about what does the last decade mean to us? What does the next decade mean to us? What's going to change? What's going to remain the same? I love the way that Butler Beyond was announced in the Indianapolis Business Journal. Respect tradition embrace innovation. What a great theme. Respect tradition. Embrace innovation. There's a great metaphor, if you will, of a, of a river. And I love the fact that they, they drew the river on the agenda. That's, that's amazing. We did not coordinate that. But think about a river. When you look upstream on a river, that's the past. The water is moving down towards you as you stand next to the river and it flows on by into the future and around a bend or off into the horizon. The past might have had trials, tribulations, there might have been rocks and rapids, but you're past that now, you're standing here along the river. The future, you don't know what the future holds. But here's the interesting thing about sitting here in front of that river in the present. If you really look at a river, it's never the same. It always changes, constantly changes. The water that's moving by you has never moved by you before, and it never will again. Today, as we sit here in this room, there may be some of you that are thinking about uh, some of the previous conversations. You might be thinking about the game you just played or the presentations that we've had today. Still others may be thinking about, oh my God, I can't wait till the bar when we're done here and I can have a drink. Or since it's Thursday, you might be thinking about, hey, what am I going to do this weekend? But I ask you, for the next little bit, to be present <laughs> in this moment. Because like the river, this moment will never happen again. We will never be the same again. You can look around the room, and that image that's in your mind will never be the same again. We will not be the same again. So we're going to chart a course for the future by understanding the past and looking <clears throat> towards the future but being in the present. 165 years of tradition. What a rich history the university has. We heard some of it throughout the day today. The, the, the history game was fantastic. I learned so much about Butler University. But think of that history. Think of the awesome responsibility to carry on that tradition and that history. 
So I want to ask you guys a question. And this is the audience participation part of this. When someone new starts in your department, how do you describe what it's like to work here? What things do you tell them about? Anyway. Other than where's the restroom? Right? <clears throat> so how do you describe it to someone? I'll pick on you, Jeff. Be free to ask somebody a question. Be free to ask somebody a question. What else do you tell them? Don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to be yourself. That's excellent. Others. I may pick on the uh, newest member back here, because what, what did you all tell him when he started? Here's your dance. Here's your dance. <laughs> We're all on the same team? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So we have a playbook that we are constantly evolving. And we try to review that with new hires. You know, here's how you handle cases. Here's different uh, parts of your job, kind of how you do things you want to do. We try to lay out part of the vision to you, like where there are beliefs and things you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Pass those on, right? So, tradition. What traditions do you have? as Butler IT. Holiday party. I planned it. He's my plan. <laughs> the holiday party. That's great. What other traditions? Ice cream during the IT freeze. Ice cream during the IT freeze. That's awesome. I like that. Lunch during back to school in the fall. Lunch during back, back, back to, to school? school in the fall. <clears throat> if someone on our team wins an award, when you get back to campus, the gauntlet is there and everybody applauds and, and celebrates your your award. Other traditions. <clears throat> so, safe space here, because we're going to talk about traditions for a minute. Which ones of these traditions do you want to keep? The holiday party. The holiday party. <laughs> <laughs> The holiday party, that's a good one to keep. What other traditions you want to keep? What? Fun hat Friday. Fun hat Friday? What traditions do you want to change? I didn't say so. Holiday party. Holiday party. <laughs> Why do you want to change the holiday party? I thought we wanted to keep it. We want we'll a holiday party. <laughs> what, more holiday parties? We'll change it. <clears throat> what traditions do you want to stop? Any? You can think of. I thought the, the conversation this morning was great uh, about uh, traditions because traditions change all the time. So let me ask you this. Can you respect tradition and not perform that tradition anymore? Is that possible? I think it is. Because what you're really doing is remembering the past. You're understanding the context of those traditions and maybe how they impact today. And sometimes traditions just don't make sense anymore because we're different, life is different, you know, I can remember for Thanksgiving gathering in the basement of my grandmother's house and having, you know, 300,000 million relatives all pinching their cheek and saying, my, I've grown from last year. And somewhere along the line, we stopped doing that. But it was still an important part of who we are as a family, who I am as a person. So, yes, I say you can respect tradition and not necessarily carry it out. I think. As we think about the Butler traditions, the broader university, and Butler IT traditions, you're embarking on a new decade. You're embarking on a new strategic plan. Things are going to be different. Look at those traditions and say, you know, maybe the ice cream freeze on uh, IT freeze Saturday or Friday, whatever it was, sorry. Um, maybe we don't need to do that anymore. I don't know, I'm just making it up, right? Uh, because of this, this, and this. But it was still a good tradition to have. So, the thing about the
present, where we are today, right here, the present is a contract between the past and the future. The decisions that we make today are going to impact our future. How do we know what decisions to make? If you are navigating this river from here on the left side of the screen, that's the Missouri River. And you're actually moving upstream against the Missouri River there. And you come to an area called Three Forks. It's an area where three rivers flow together to form the Missouri River. How do you know what river to take? How do you know what channel? Because that the top one has multiple channels. How do you know which one to take? You know which one to take because you have a vision of where you are going. Without that vision, you're just wandering around aimlessly. But if you have a vision, like my heroes Lewis and Clark did when they reached there, they were trying to cross the Rocky Mountains. So guess which way they went? Toward the Rocky Mountains because they had a vision. They have no idea if it was the right way to go. They just had an eye on their future, on their vision. So we talk a lot about, especially in business, in IT, we talk about strategic planning and we talk about vision. So one of the sins that they teach you about as a public speaker is never ever read the slides. So you're going to read it. So please uh, read aloud the definition from lexico.com of vision. All together. The ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. I think it's very interesting because as I started off, words are important. Read that first sentence. You don't have to read it aloud. The first part of that sentence again. Think about or plan the future. Notice something? It doesn't say plan for the future. It says plan the future. It implies that you're creating the future. You're making a plan to create the future. The other part that I think it's also interesting, imagination or wisdom. It doesn't say imagination and wisdom. Sometimes you need imagination and sometimes you need wisdom. It's an or. The other thing that I find interesting is when businesses get a hold of the definition, they take it from one sentence uh, and they make it a paragraph. So I'd like you to read this one as well, together, all together now. An inspirational description of what an organization might to achieve or accomplish in the midterm or long-term future. It is intended to serve as a clear guide to choosing current and future courses of action. I feel like in the church with the clouds and bringing this to A couple of things I want to point out here also. Aspirational. Aspirational. We all want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We want to be part of a vision that is aspirational. I read a great blog post a couple of years ago called Your ROI is Not a Vision. And basically it was a message to business leaders that like to talk about revenue, bottom line, EBITDA. All those things are vitally important. The fact is your employees probably don't care. Right? They're going to get their paycheck anyway. Um, I always like to think about tech companies since we're here in Indianapolis and we talk about tech startups all the time. Because the executives of a tech startup, they're all worried about the transaction. When are we going to sell? When are we going to build enough of a base, a minimal viable product, and then we can sell the company and go on and do something else? And then I think of the person that's the event coordinator in marketing. Does she care? what the multiple is that you're going to sell the organization for? No, she doesn't care because she's not a part owner of the company. So when there's a transaction and you get that nice 10 multiple or whatever it is, she doesn't get a piece of that. And when her company gets bought by somebody else, she can do her job. 
So you have to have a vision that goes well beyond the dollars and cents. It has to be aspirational. The other piece that I want to point out here is the word God. Since we're traveling the river from the past to the present to the future, God. Your vision should be a litmus test that if you have an idea for a project or an initiative, you should be able to hold it up against that vision and say, does it fit? And if it doesn't fit, you let somebody else do that. And if it fits, that may be one that you consider doing. So Pete's document that we were looking at earlier has some things over the next five years that he'd like to achieve, that, he, that, that he's laying out the vision. As projects come up, lay them against that. Where do they fit? Do they fit? How many of you have read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great? A few of you. How many of you have heard of Jim Collins' book, Good to Great? Even more, that's great. So there's a fantastic quote that Collins is famous for, and that is, it's better to get the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, and then the right people in the seats on the bus. Have you all heard that, getting the right people in the seats, in the right seats? It's a very common leadership management thing. What we don't really remember is the rest of the sentence, and then figure out where to drive. So I'm going to be pretty bold here, and I'm going to disagree with Jim Collins. One of the leadership gods of all time, I'm going to be audacious and disagree with him. Because how many here have ever been on a cruise? Awesome. So you get on the cruise. This is the way it works, I, I know. As you get on the cruise, you take your luggage to your stateroom. You open the window and you look out, if you happen to have a stateroom with a window. Okay, but you, you look out. And then the captain comes on the intercom and he says, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on our cruise today. I'd like you all to come to the Lido deck because we're going to decide where we're going. <laughs> what? You didn't go on that cruise so that you could arbitrarily pick where you're going. You went on that cruise because you knew where the cruise was going and you wanted to experience that journey. That's why you're all here. Because you know where Butler University is going. There's a vision. You want to share in that vision. You're on this team because you know where it's going. Because it's up to the leaders of an organization, whether you are the president of the university, whether you're the CIO of Butler IT, whether you're the department head, or whether you're an individual contributor, at some point you're called upon to and you're called upon to have a vision of where you're going. So how do you do that? What, are, what steps is a leader supposed to take to create that vision? It starts with knowing where you are. That sounds pretty simple, but think about it. We're here in downtown Indianapolis. When we're done, we're all going to go to Paris, Illinois. What direction are we going to go? West. How do you know that? Because you know where you are. You know that Paris, Illinois, it's in Illinois, it must be west of here. You may not know exactly how to get to Paris, Illinois, but you know you need to head west. Because you know where you are. So it starts with an assessment. And you study what you have in front of you. What are your resources, human and otherwise? What tools do you have at your disposal? This is a great concept, whether you are leading an organization or leading your own personal life. It starts with looking at yourself in full transparency, without any of the guises of self-deception. There's a great book, in fact the title of it, amazingly enough, is Leadership and Self-Deception. But it teaches you to hold yourself up, this gets a little metaphysical, but you hold yourself up without any biases, and you examine yourself, and you identify your strengths and weaknesses. We've all taken those personality profiles and identified strengths and weaknesses. But you look at it without self-deception. You really understand what are you good at, what are you not good at. 
We never take that far enough. In my opinion. And here I'm going to deal. Uh, I'm going to disagree with another great leadership guru. Um, Franklin Covey said, basically, you maximize your strengths and you make your weaknesses irrelevant. Sorry, it was Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker said, Mac maximize your strengths, make your weaknesses irrelevant. If I'm going to do, if all I'm ever going to do is focus on my strengths, I'm not going to grow. Several years ago, before I became a CIO, I knew that's what I wanted to do in my career. I wanted to be a CIO. The problem was, I hated doing presentations. I would get so nervous the night before that I couldn't sleep. When finally I was up in front of the room doing a presentation, I'd forget everything that I was supposed to be saying. I was horrible at it. But what I realized was, if I was going to achieve what I wanted to achieve in my career, I couldn't outsource that to somebody else, right? I couldn't have somebody else doing my presentations for me, because then that's who everybody is listening to and following, is the person doing that speaking. So I intentionally put myself in high anxiety, low risk, See how I tied that in? Uh, I love the way she said that because that's exactly right. I started speaking to any rotary group that would have me all over the state of Indiana. Because, especially in these little small towns, how many times can the insurance guy come talk about insurance? They have a, they have a meeting once a week and they need a speaker. So I'd come talk about Lewis and Clark. I could talk about Lewis and Clark all day long. It was. High anxiety, but very, very low risk. The worst that could happen is I get a free lunch. But what happened over time is I was able to take that nervous energy and channel it into kind of adrenaline to get up in front of audience and talk to them about things that matter in their careers. You could look at another weakness of mine, I'll confess. I suck at project management. I'm horrible at it. It's way too detailed for my brain. But guess what? I can hire some fantastic project managers who can drive unbelievable initiatives and unbelievable tra uh, transformation. That's a skill I can outsource. So as you're looking at yourself and you're analyzing your strengths and weaknesses, take it to that next level. Does that weakness something that you can outsource? Or is that something that you need to develop at least to be adequate at? You may never be uh, an opera singer if that's a weakness that you want to do. You might learn how to sing Mary Had a Little. Right? It's the same thing when you're building a department or leading a department. You want to look at that yourself first as a leader of what skills do I have? What do I bring to the table? And then you want to hire team members that complement you, not look like you and act like you. Right? So for me, I'm going to hire good project managers because that's a weakness of mine. I'm going to make sure that I've got them on my staff all the time. But then you also look at the department as a whole. Where are your strengths and weaknesses within your department? One of the challenges that a CIO has all the time is do you build it or do you buy it? Right? And we're talking about an application. You could develop an application or you could go buy it. There's trade ups. It's the same thing as you look at the skills of your team. Do you build it? Do you hire new? Do you partner and form a strategic alliance with someone that can help you? So, as you're working on creating that vision, you have to be foundationally aware of where you are so that you can set a realistic vision. So you know. The next thing is you look at the future. I, I loved some of the exercises that we did today and uh, the document that Pete produced looking at 2025. Uh, when I was a CIO, one of the things that I did, uh, we were working on a five year strategic plan, getting ready to launch that. It was uh, July of 2010. And we had a New Year's Eve party for December 35th. 31st, 2015. 
2010. Try finding a Happy New Year 2016 sign. 2010. It's a little hard to do. But the idea was to put everyone in the room in that mindset of what does it look like five years from now. So we're looking here at the beginning of this decade and thinking about 2030. What does society look like in 2030? What does technology look like in 2030? What's the economic situation in 2030? What's the environmental situation in 2030? You don't have to believe that climate change is human induced, but the fact is the climate is changing. What's it look like in 2030? And we're not going to talk politics here, but what do policies and politics look like in 2030? You start to form that picture, in, in, and the, the truth of the matter is, is you're going to create these pictures because <coughs> no one can predict the future. No one knows what's going to happen. What happens is people have a vision for the future. They look at science, technology, economics, environmental, and policy, and they form a picture. The other thing that they do is they look around them and they talk to people in different organizations. We had this great conversation with the CIO network uh, that Jay mentioned. Uh, and we were doing this exercise where I was uh, leading them in a discussion of what does it look like in 2030. And one of the guys who works for um, uh, Duke Real Estate, Duke Construction, he says, well, you know, because of autonomous vehicles and uh, robotics within a warehouse, we don't need to have our warehouses so close to Indianapolis. We can put them out in the country because people won't have to drive to work there as much. And I turned to, to Brad Fruit, who's the CIO for Beck's Hybrid Seed Company, and a farmer, and I said, Brad, what do you think about them putting their warehouses in your farm fields? Led to an inter interesting discussion. So don't just look at higher education. Look at other industries. And you look for the impact of what's going to happen if this happens. Uh, here locally, John McDonald, uh, he's the former CEO of Clear Object. John is fantastic at looking at what's the impact of autonomous vehicles. Well, autonomous vehicles, we can do ride sharing more with autonomous vehicles, so there's going to be less vehicles on the road, which means we need less parking garages, which means we need fewer roads. And he goes on and on and on. You look at those impacts and that begins to give your picture for the future. Then, what you do is you look at those and decide, probably as a group, which ones of those scenarios are most likely to occur. And maybe you pick three or four. The other thing you do is you say, which ones do we want to occur? You know, they, they talked this morning about 25%, I think was the number, uh, of people who don't believe that you need a, a higher end degree uh, to be successful. So what happens to Butler University if people stop going to college, going to university? That may not be the future that you want, but that may be a likely future. So how do you plan for that? And how do you create this vision that says we're going to do more online courses, we're going to do a more adult education, we're going to do more alternative education? All those types of things that they talked about this morning. Those are likely scenarios for the future. President Danko doesn't know what the future is. He's identified with his board what they think are the most likely scenarios and the ones that they want. And they're starting to put together Butler Beyond with here's how we get there. So as the IT department, you've got this vision that you're starting to put together. And you know where you are, which leads us to the next step. How do you get there? This is where the work comes in. The easiest way to do this is to start with the end in mind. Have you ever played that children's maze game? Have you ever sat down with a kid's maze where you got to draw the line all the way through the maze? Have you ever cheated and started at the end? It's a hell of a lot easier, I'm telling you. <laughs> Trick. If you're sitting down with your kids or your nieces and nephews, start at the back and work your way. It's the same thing with a strategic plan. 
you have a vision for where the future is, what's your first step? It's easier to start backwards and say, if I'm going to achieve this, then I need to do this. Oh, and if I'm going to do this, then I need to do this. Then I need to do this. So let's look at it from a water perspective. Let's say I live in Indianapolis, Indiana, because I do. And let's say I wanted to go to New Orleans, Louisiana. There's probably a thousand different ways that I can go to get there. There's probably dozens of modes of transportation that will get me from Indianapolis to New Orleans. But what if I want to go by water? Can I do it? Can I get there by water? Well, we know that New Orleans is on the Mississippi River. We know near St. Louis, the Ohio River converges with the Mississippi River. We know in southern Indiana, the Wabash River flows into the Ohio River. We know, just a little bit north from there, the White River, see, a bit closer, the White River flows into the Wabash. In downtown Indianapolis, Fall Creek flows into White River. At Fort Harrison State Park, Mud Creek flows into Fall Creek. Guess what creek's in my backyard? Mud Creek. I can put my canoe in Mud Creek in my backyard, and I can canoe to New Orleans. Now, I'm probably not making it there in time for Mardi Gras this year, <laughs> maybe next year. It is certainly not going to be an easy task to get there, nor is it going to be a straight line. First of all, the rivers themselves wind and bend. Second of all, there's obstacles in the way. One of the, the questions on the game we were just playing was about obstacles. And how do you remove those obstacles? How do you get around them? If I'm canoeing, there could be trees that have fallen in the creek that I have to go around, under, over. There, most undoubtedly, is going to be inclement weather along the way that's going to delay me. There's going to be locks and dams. There's going to be lots and lots of dams to get there that I'm going to have to go around. I'm probably going to have to leave the river to portage around it. There may be times when I actually have to go backwards to go forward. So as you're looking at your projects, you're going to have obstacles in the way of your vision. The university is going to ask you to do something that just does not align with what Pete has in the strategic plan for IT. What do you do? You say, no, I'm not going to do that. I don't know about you, Pete, but I never had that luxury as a CIO. Uh, you always have to do that, right? You have to do the ones that the business wants. But here's what you can do. If you have a vision of where you're going, keep your eye on that's what we're trying to do. Look at those projects as opportunities to take a small step forward. Maybe it's a piece of uh, a documentation that's missing in a particular system. So you take the time during Project XYZ to do that piece of documentation. Get you a little bit closer. There's probably not a lot of projects that you could think of that you couldn't at least make an incremental step towards your vision. So you know where you are, you know where you want to go, and you've laid out a plan to get there. That brings us almost to today. Right? We've got some of this, some of these pieces together. The next challenge, and the challenge that the university is facing, the challenge that, that Pete, and Mary, and Joe are facing, the challenge that all of you are facing, is how do you communicate? How do you communicate this and create in the mind of, of the listener a vision so compelling? They want to follow you and achieve that vision. Well, the human mind is wired for storytelling. We love a good story. Think of all the books, the movies, uh, the, the stories that you heard as a kid at the library were filled with stories. They always have five major components for the most part. They have characters, they have setting, they have a plot, they have conflict and they have resolution. Five keys to the story. We're going to focus on one 
setting. Because you know what always is in a good story? A picture. <laughs> the author paints a picture so compelling, so vividly, that you as the reader or the listener can put yourself in that story. So we're going to try a little word association game. You all awake because we're here at the end of the day. Word association. I'm going to say a word, and I want you to yell out the first thing that pops in your mind. Okay? Ready? Boat. Water. River. Water. Water. What else? Did anybody say cruise ship? Come on, I planted that early. That's being right there. So when I say boat, we kind of associate it with water, we associate it with rivers because we've been talking about that. But your mental image may be a, a boat that's different than mine. We have a different picture. So how are we ever going to know when we find our boat? Because we're all looking for something different. So we're going to try it again. I'm going to say another word. And I want you to yell out the first thing that comes to your mind. Canoe. Paddle. 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 Boat. Kayak. Kayak. Again, we're closer, but we still don't have a picture of what we're doing. So, we're talking about a canoe, not a kayak. Okay. <laughs> There's something about the romance of a canoe. The curved, upswept lines at its bow and stern. Our canoe is 16 feet long. It's made of Kevlar, which means it's lightweight, but very, very durable. Its color is a light tan, almost with hints of orange in it. The gunnels are highly brushed and polished aluminum. The canoe itself is very clean, spotless, and highly polished as well, to the point that the water and the shoreline that it sits on reflects on the hull of the canoe. The water that our canoe is sitting in is a lake. Deep, deep blue color of the lake. The surface of the lake is as smooth as glass. The sky is a bright blue, not a cloud in the sky. Around the perimeter of the lake are densely forested evergreens. The lake must have been carved out of rock because the shore that we're standing on, observing our canoe, is a flat rock, worn smooth by eons of water, weather, rain. The sun casts a shadow of our canoe as we're looking at it. Now, if I say, Butler IT, let's go canoe. We're going to picture something pretty close to that. We have the same vision. We have the same goal in mind. We picture the same thing. And that's what we've been doing today, is starting to paint a picture of what the future looks like. The future. The future is bright. As we Look at that future. Are you ready? Are you ready to embrace that future? The decisions we make today are going to impact that future. We live in one of the most exciting times ever to be involved in technology. If we embrace innovation, understand innovation, we heard earlier, innovation can be scary. Innovation means change. Change can be scary. Innovation means failure. There's going to be projects that you do that just flat fail. That's scary. Innovation means being vulnerable because you're going to suggest an idea and maybe the person next to you laughs at you. So I used to be CIO of Goodwill. And we were doing a strategic planning session, brainstorming. We were having a hard time coming up with ideas. And somebody said, well, what would, what would we 
never do. And somebody said, we would never build a hotel. And that got to be the joke for the rest of the weekend. Because we were going to call it Good Nights. Right? Because Goodwill would never do that. People laugh. Do you know what they're building next to their headquarters in downtown Indianapolis today? An apartment building. No, it's not a hotel. But it's pretty doggone close. I got to believe that that joke about the hotel led to that strategy to build middle income housing in downtown Indianapolis to help with the worker shortage at the businesses downtown. That's embracing innovation. That's taking the risk of failure. Why do I say today is one of the most exciting times to be involved in technology? Because technology is changing at an ever accelerating pace. Businesses everywhere are bringing IT from the back room to the boardroom. You heard it today. The president is interested in information technology. That didn't happen 10 years ago. Well, trust me, it did not happen 10 years ago. Businesses everywhere are understanding what transformational capabilities technology has for them. I mentioned Vex Hybrid Seed the other day, or, or a little bit ago. Agriculture, they grow seeds. Not very high tech. But can you imagine drones flying over the cornfields of Indiana, measuring the plant heights at different times during the growing season? Connecting with sensors in the ground to measure the moisture and the temperature of the soil? It's real. They're doing it today. Seed company. Wabash National, manufacturer of tractor truck trailers. You know the big semi truck trailers. They don't make the semi trucks, they make the trailers. Yet their use of industrial Internet of Things, robotics, is changing the very industry that they, they belong in. They're now starting to embed sensors in, in the back ends of those trucks themselves. <coughs> that's innovation, that's embracing technology, and that's the world we live in. As being in IT, you're probably familiar maybe with Moore's Law. Simplified, what Moore said was the power of technology would double every two years. Every two years. Here's the kicker. He said that in 1965. Technology had only been around for 15 or 20 years. So it was really easy for him to say, oh, over the last uh, 20 years, yeah, it's doubled every two years. Great. We're standing here today, 55 years later, and he was right. It has doubled every two years. So, several years ago, I had a company. Uh, the name of the company was Confluence Dynamics, and I'm not going to geek out on, on uh, everything about the name, but I'll tell you where the name came from, basically, was the science of fluid dynamics. And here's what fluid dynamics says. When you have two rivers that flow together, if they're of equal volume, and they flow together, converge at a confluence, see, confluence dynamics, the, the resulting river is not additively more powerful, it is exponentially more powerful. It doubles in strength by adding in another river. This beautiful stream gently flowing is the Mississippi River. And as it makes its way to New Orleans, stream after stream flows into it, and it gets exponentially stronger every time so that when it gets to New Orleans, it can move boulders the size of buses. That's the power of exponential growth. Let's look at it a different way. Eric Brynjolfsson and Andrew McAfee in their book, Race Against the Machine, use the fable of the invention of the game of chess, the creation of chess, as an example. So it's the year 600, it's India. A mathematician invents this new game, the game of chess. He presents it to the king. The king is so excited with this new game and this new challenge that he says to the mathematician, I will grant you any wish. Anything within my power of my kingdom is yours. The mathematician 
mathematician, being a mathematician, says, well, your majesty, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take that chessboard, and on the first square, I want you to put one grain of rice. On the second square, I want you to double and put two. On the third square, I want you to double it and put four. Continue to double it until you reach the end of the chessboard. The king laughs. Oh my god, this guy could have had gold, silver, jewels, and he wants a few measly grains of rice. So the king gets the chessboard and starts. Something magical happened. Something mathematical happened. By the time he reached the halfway point of the chessboard, there were over four billion grains of rice. What happened on square 33? Four billion became eight billion, became 16 billion. By the time he reached the end of the chessboard, the pile of rice was a mountain the size of Mount Everest. That's the power of exponential growth. That's the time we live in. Rev. Josephson and McAfee went on to say that if you use this chessboard analogy and you align it with Moore's Law, in 2006, we reached the halfway point of the chessboard. 32 dumplings. That's why it feels like technology is changing at an ever accelerating pace. We're in the second half of the chessboard. It is accelerating every single day. You only have to look back 14 years to understand and get a glimpse of what the next 14 years are going to look like. In 2006, 2007, the iPhone was introduced. Now we're on iPhone 11. I'm a tongue guy, so I don't know. Um, but we also have the iPad, the iPod, Apple TV, Apple Watch, Apple everything. None of it existed in 2006. Chrome, here we go, now I'm more comfortable. The world's most popular internet browser, used by more people than live in some countries, didn't exist in 2006. Tesla gives us two great examples. No one was talking about driving an electric car 2006. Unless, of course, you were watching the Jetsons on TV. And now, just about every new car manufacturer has some electric component to its engine, whether it's hybrid or full electric. But even more amazing than an electric vehicle, a self-driving vehicle, autonomous vehicles. There are buses today <coughs> driving around Las Vegas, Nevada without a driver. That's amazing in the last 14 years. Airbnb, Lyft, Uber, none of them existed in 2006, yet they've all disrupted their industry. And speaking of disrupting the industry, Spotify and the death of the album. Who here used GPS on your phone to get here today? A lot of people here. Who here uses GPS? To get to work right there. I do. I know where my office is. I know the way. I know the way home. I use it because the other thing that's amazing is live traffic. Live traffic gets on the phone. I was driving home from St. Louis a couple of months ago, and Google alerted me to an 11 mile backup from an accident on I 70 near the airport. I was going to be home hours late, but we routed. It took me off I-70, took me on some roads that I'd never been on before, and frankly, I don't really want to be on again. <laughs> but I got home only 10 minutes late from my original ETA. Didn't exist in 2006. GPS in 2006, I remember having a very difficult conversation with the president of my company in 2006 as a brand new CIO. And he was complaining about his Garmin GPS because, hey, it plugs in, it's got to be an IT problem, right? <laughs> and he was complaining about the technology because he was using it to go to his lake house. And it routed him, and if he followed the instructions, he would have ended up in the middle of the lake. That's how far we've come with this technology. 3D printing. 
And yeah, this little rock and roll octopus guy is pretty cool, made out of rubber or plastic, whatever it is. But do you know they're building houses with 3D printers? They're building cars with 3D printers. And who here read about the scientists and the doctors in Israel that used human tissue and a 3D printer to print a human heart? Can you imagine what that's going to do for the transplant list? It's going to eliminate it in our lifetime. 3G, 4G, 5G. We're on the cusp of 5G. 10 gigabits per second. 100 times faster than 4G. Can you imagine what that's going to do for your daily lives? Can you imagine what that's going to do for businesses? Can you imagine what that's going to do for life on Butler University campus? It will be revolutionary. Last year, scientists created a computer that had the processing power of the human brain. Not the cognitive ability, and no, it didn't have feelings and emotion, but the pure processing power of the human brain. If Moore's law holds, and most industry pundits believe that it will, in 2050, there will be a computer that has more processing power than all of humanity. What an awesome responsibility we have. We're in technology. We get to drive that future. We get to create that future together. That's what we're doing here today. So let me ask you again, are you ready? Are you ready to embrace innovation? Are you ready to respect tradition? Are you ready to understand the past and the context? And are you ready to build that future? The decisions that we make here today, the decisions that you and you and you make here today will shape your tomorrow. The decisions that you make here today will shape your teams tomorrow. The decisions that you make here today will shape Butler University's tomorrow and all of our tomorrows. So are you ready to respect tradition and embrace innovation? Because the decisions we make right now will change our tomorrow. Thank you. Okay.